Hi, everyone. How's senior pace going? Good? It is bad, isn't it? Are you at least making something really cool? Are you making something kind of cool? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, well, it's all going to be over sooner than you could possibly imagine. Ooh, I see an infusion of people. <clears throat> all right, um, it's 6.05. Oh, wait. Thumb twiddling. How do you feel about these CTO talks? It seems like if I were like deep in a project, I would kind of appreciate, but also kind of hate being pulled away from it. Yes. That sounds about right? OK, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, well, I'll try not to take too long, and I'll try to make it kind of valuable, at least somewhat valuable, moderately valuable. I mean, look at this picture. It's a pretty cool picture, uh, though you can't see it. No, I don't think so. I think it's going to get brighter. Yeah, it's going to warm up and get brighter. All right, so let's get started. Um, if you don't know me, and I think everyone in this room knows me, but my name's Ashi, um, and this is the first incarnation of the Architecture CTO talk, which I agreed to give like about a month ago. Um, and I don't actually really remember how it happened. Like there was, there was some sort of staff meeting and like someone was like, we should have a new CTO talk. And I was like, oh, I'd love to do one on architecture. And then I like immediately regretted it. Or when I started to like actually formulate the talk, I began to like deeply regret it because I realized that I don't really know how to talk about architecture, <laughs> which is not, I think, a very comforting thing to hear from <laughs> the person who's going to talk to you for the next hour. Um, but I, the thing is, when we think about architecture, and like particularly when we think about software architecture, we end up thinking about the finished products of it. So we think about like the, the way that a program is put together. We maybe think about a design document or a white paper. These are some like artifacts of the architectural process. But in order to like even understand one of those for any like reasonably complicated system, you need a lot of domain specific knowledge. Um, there's like a lot of like different patterns. There's a lot of like different ways that you could solve any given problem. And so I kind of imagined a talk where I was standing up here being like, here are five design patterns that you should really know. Here is the first one, the like immutable state store. Here's another one. And it just sounded like, like a talk that I didn't want to attend, let alone give. And so what I want to do instead is do something a little bit more interactive. Um, and I'm not going to like, give you a whole bunch of like, okay, here are these design patterns, here are these like, these like specific ways of putting software together. Um, because those are all going to change, right? Like software is like constantly changing, we say this a lot, but like the design patterns, the five design patterns that you need to know in 10 years are not the five that you need to know now. And they're probably not the five that you need to know in one hour. So because we have this like continuous iterative process, what I want to do is talk about that process. And so I'm going to like provide a framework of a few questions that you can ask about your project at like every level, at the highest level and then going down to the tiniest pieces that ideally will help you break it into smaller pieces. So that's, that's really what we do when we do architecture. We take this like big problem statement and we break it up into like progressively smaller pieces until there are pieces small enough that we understand how to write the code for them. So that's our agenda here. And I wanna start with, um, with this framework, this axiom that I didn't come up with but I'm just gonna like accept as true for the moment, which is that everything we do must either solve a problem or create a problem. And creating problems is the domain of art, and solving problems is the domain of engineering. So this sounds a little bit like a dig at art, and it's not actually at all. Um, both of these things are important. But right now, we're going to focus on solving problems. 
And solving problems is a process that you go through, and it's all about the questions that you ask. So <clears throat> the first question that I just want to load into your brain and have you keep in mind as we go through this exercise is a little bit too small on this slide, but it's what problem am I trying to solve? Um, it is incredibly easy in the process of really pursuing any project, but in particular in software, it's very easy to end up um, solving problems other than the one you meant to solve, solving problems that were not actually problems for anyone, um, or solving nothing at all, sort of pursuing a, like, a rabbit hole that seems kind of interesting and isn't like, actually going to help you like, build a product or like, improve anyone's life. And I actually want to like, defend all of those activities and say that they are all OK. Like You maybe don't have to have a goal in mind anytime you're coding. You don't have to have a goal in mind anytime you're working on a project. But if you are like, trying to build something for a purpose, it is extremely helpful to keep that purpose in mind and to keep asking like, how you're serving it at like, every level of the problem. OK, so that's, that's like the big question. And in fact, all of these other questions are sort of subsets of it. There are different ways of looking at the, um, of like answering the question, what am I trying to solve, that might be like easier, more tractable, or they might give you a better perspective on um, some particular component by asking them. OK, so these questions are like, what is my input? Notice how this problem, or this question became all big, because it's big. Um, what is my input? What's my output? And what's my test? So these are like fairly granular, but you can actually ask them about like really big components, right? Like Google search has pretty defined input and output, even though like on it is made of like a billion little pieces. In the end, it's this function that sort of takes in something and produces something. And to varying degrees of, we can like productively describe a lot of things. Um, by their input and output. And if we do that, then what we've done is we've defined their interface. We've said, like, here's the shape of this thing. And anything that, like, anything that can consume its output, anything that takes as input the output of this component, is something that we can attach to it. And anything that has the same input-output characteristics and um, passes the same tests is something that we can replace it with. So it gives us um, the ability to have these kind of Lego blocks that describe our software, um, our software project and let us like, put them together in different ways until we have something that's actually going to achieve our goals. <clears throat> okay, so these are the questions, and that's basically it for the slides I have. Now we're going to go through a few case studies. I have three questions, three problems that I'd like us to solve together. So you're going to have to talk, or this is going to be boring and short. On the other hand, if you just want this to be short, you can just like sit there silent and I'll be like, all right, <laughs> I guess we're done. So let's look at this. The first problem I have is I want to edit code. You might all be having this problem right now. I want to be editing code, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm here in this talk. Channel that. Channel that into answering this, <laughs> into answering this problem or into coming up with a solution for this. So, you might notice that this is like not a very well-defined problem statement, as, in fact, most problem statements you get will not be. So what am I like, getting at? Like, what sub-problems am I implying by like, bringing this up? Yeah? That your code isn't finished and that there are specific issues you want to address by editing it? Yeah. Uh, so my code's unfinished. So, oh, unfinished. Um, so I want to um, I want to make it work in a certain way, and I want to see it as I'm doing that. And these basic these are basically all like problems solved by tools that we use every day, right? Like you all have a text editor. So let's start considering solutions to this in that vein. Like, what would it take to make a text editor? It's not like, it's not a super hard thing, right? Like, people do it. Um, but what are the pieces of it? Yeah? Are some kind of like DOM element that will display how things are working 
Yeah, so you need something that can actually solve this problem, right? This, this sub-problem, which is like, I want to see the code that I'm editing as I do it. So let's say that we have, I don't know, a viewer. <laughs> and what is it doing? How do we characterize what it's going to consume and what it's going to produce? Yeah, so a text file, and then let's just say it's going to output pixels. <laughs> I mean, there's probably a bunch of layers under there, but I don't care about them. So <laughs> we'll just glom all the layers together and say that pixels are the output. OK, and we can test this. We can kind of imagine a mapping. I'm maybe going to erase this, because like, we can imagine taking a bunch of text files and saying, like, OK, it should look like this. And like, here's what um, we expect the output to be. So what else, um, OK, so what else is involved in an editor? Yeah, so somehow we need to take an input, right? So we have like some kind of thing that's going to like receive gestures. Ooh. So it's going to receive gestures, like a stream of user gestures. Um, and what's it going to send out? Gestures gesture like any kind of maybe a, maybe a different way of um, articulating this as actions. So like something, anything I do, right? Like I hit the up key, I like tapped here. All of those like need to either change the state of the editor or not change the state of the editor, as the case might be. Um, so what is our, what do we want to call this thing? Editor. What is it like actually producing? Yeah. Is it just the text, uh, altering the text file? Yeah, so it can be altering the text file directly. How do I deal with things like, um, oh, I can't save this, right? So what did I just do? Yeah, so how do I represent that? So pixels, it has to be represented in pixels, but it also has to be represented in some other way, where like when I hit delete, I know what needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some kind of there's some kind of state of the whole editor. So. Maybe this outputs a text file and some kind of state. And I think you might be starting to see where this is going. <laughs> I, I see a direction this is going in any case. OK, so we have something that can um, take a text file and output pixels. We have another thing which can take um, a stream of actions and output a text file. So it looks like these two things kind of go together. Um, one thing I'm noticing is that the viewer has to be able to, like, if the editor has some state, like something is selected, the viewer has to actually be able to like, represent that. So probably we can eliminate these, um, this part of the contract between the editor and viewer and just say that the viewer takes an editor state and this thing does not. But now we've lost, completely lost the plot in terms of our connection to a file. So we probably want something else that does that. And because we have because like we have these ports and we kind of know what they are, I can say what do I call it? A writer. It's gonna take as input an editor state, and as output it's gonna give us a file. And so now we at least have a few components and we can kind of play with how they attach to each other. I think you're probably noticing that there is a framework that we have all used a lot that we seem to have um, reimagined here, right? Like you could easily put all of these things into a Redux store and have a pretty good setup for a text editor that can like handle whatever commands you throw at it and you have something listening to the store and writing files. <coughs> so questions about how we 
got there or about the process or anything. It's like a, the first example is meant to be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, so that is definitely going to happen. And there's, there's really nothing you can do about the fact that, it, that sometimes you're going to have to like, completely change um, some fundamental assumptions. So one thing that helps is like more experience helps you see, like, oh, this thing is like, like this other pattern that we know works. So this is the part of architecture that's very, very hard to, or it's not like very hard to teach, but it's like hard to teach in one hour because it's like exposure to all of these patterns and then um, the sort of lived experience of having worked with them and then knowing that like, okay, if we, if we go down this route, here's what we're going to end up spending a lot of time doing. Here are the pros and cons of this approach. Um, that said, if you like have, if you have like a reasonable blueprint, if you sort of like explicitly sketch out everything, it should at least make the process of changing how everything works the inevitable process of changing how everything works easier. Because you can go and say like, okay, like I actually like need to change something in here and I can see sort of where, like what pieces are going to need to change in order to like make the data flow better. <clears throat> yeah. Can you just repeat the question that yeah, so that was in response to the question, like, how do you know if you're making good choices? To which the answer is basically, like, you don't, but you should stay on your toes so that, like, maybe, if you, so that when you have to change your choices, you will know what to do. And I, like, really recommend having some document that's like this or, like, possibly wordier than this for, like, any project you're working on so that there's at least somewhere a, like, 50,000 foot view of the whole code base because, and like what it's supposed to be doing, because otherwise, like you build up all of this knowledge about like how things work and how they fit together, and that knowledge is like not anywhere except your brain. And then you like get hit by a bus is the traditional like bad thing, but like perhaps you leave, <laughs> um, or perhaps you come back to the project like a year later and you have no idea what's going on. Okay, so I want to add um, a complication here, which is. Another problem, namely, um, my code is broken. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to say my code doesn't work, and I wish it does. <laughs> so now I'm asking for a different kind of feature, right? I'm asking for an editor that not just like lets me edit code, but also like tells me when it's wrong. So you're. Um, editors might do this a little bit too, right? They might say like, okay, let's, they might run a linter and connect to it. Um, they might do something else. What are some options we have here? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so you can build in a parser of some kind that, um, What's it going to consume? Probably um, an, a text file. And then the output is going to be like a tree of some kind, some kind of like representation of the source. Um, I'm, I'm just going to call it the AST. Um, yeah, sorry. An AST is an abstract syntax tree which is a tree of objects that describes um, a source file. So it'll look something like, if you have two plus two, it'll be like operation plus, like integer lit or number literal two, two, number literal two. And so it like describes the expressions, yeah. Uh, you're gonna need all the rules that you're checking again? Yeah, so we need, that's the other thing, we need like some set of rules um, which, I guess a rule takes as input an abstract syntax tree, and as output it has some set of errors, right? Where an error is 
it, it just is its output. So where an error has like something like a location and the problem. OK, so if we add these components, um, and maybe this, this ends up being a little bit different, but if we have something that can parse a file into like a collection of syntactic elements and then something else that can verify them, then we can fix a lot of like easy problems, like you forgot a semicolon. What about hard problems? Like, oh, you were using this library and you were using it fine, but the library changed and so now your methods aren't working, or now your function calls aren't working. Because that's like way more irritating than I forgot a semicolon. Maybe that's not true. <laughs> Semicolons are really irritating. But it's, it's up there, right? It's up there and it's a very hard problem to solve. But let's take a stab at how you might, how might you approach that. that could go in and like get somehow like get to the error yeah. and then and then the question is like how does it know why that error happened and that's that's like a very hard problem right i'm sort of asking for an ai that can fix your program for you um, and that sounds like maybe if we can get that then that's great for one person then the rest of us are out of jobs <laughs> but i think there might be there might be like a dumber thing we could do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you had like a file with all the libraries in it, and let's say the version that just periodically check if any of the versions are broken. I mean that wouldn't necessarily say that that's the reason it's broken, but you at least know that something changed. Yeah, but actually this is this is like totally a great strategy because like now instead of like having to have intelligence, we just need a lot of data. And this data is probably not too hard to collect because, for example, if, if we're restricting ourselves to JavaScript code, there's NPM out there. So you can look at the NPM database and be like, hey, these are, like, these are all of the NPMs in the world. And your text editor, by virtue of like, running on lots of developers' computers, like millions of developers are using your text editor, um, they, you have a lot of data. You have this data stream about like, what how many people are using a given library and how often um, it is busted. <laughs> and you can notice that, hey, when React Router like, updated to 3.8.9, there was this huge spike in errors. And your editor can say, like, OK, by the way, you're using this library. We think there's something wrong with it. <laughs> um, maybe you should use this other version that people have been having more luck with. And does that fix everything? No, that like obviously doesn't fix every programming problem, but it's an approach to fixing some of them. And so if we wanted to implement that, we would probably we would have to have like a database of some kind that has like what would it have? I guess it would have like all of npm. So we have npm which takes um, package name and version and like outputs a package. And we have our own um, like npm verifier that for a given npm um, it's going to tell us probably a set of errors. And so now we can kind of, because these things are going to emit basically the same kinds of problems, we can like plug this into our existing architecture. OK, great. Questions before we go on? This is by far the least interesting exercise. OK, let's look at the next problem. Uh, the next problem is like a little bit harder, and it is, I can't find things on the web. And you might be like, just use Google. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, pretend there's no Google. <laughs> um, in fact, pretend the heading says, like, I want you to make Google. <laughs> like, why is there no search engine? OK, so how? How do you design Google Search? This, incidentally, is my favorite interview question. Yeah, so we need to like crawl some web pages, right? So we're going to have a crawler. Um, let's say it takes one URL and outputs like a bunch of documents. I should be consistent about this one way or another. And it'll, it does that by like crawling from that URL 
some depth or like forever, I don't know, it just returns to us a bunch of documents. We can figure out the specifics of how these things work a lot later. Okay, yeah? It classifies the pages based on keywords? Yeah, so, so that sounds like it should take a document and then output, what is it, how is exactly is it going to um, classify it? Yeah, so it, I guess it just needs to return all of the word, all of the like search terms, maybe less stop words. Stop words are things like and, but the, that you just sort of discard because they don't have much semantic meaning. Um, yeah, so it can be like a list of terms. Okay, so I have my crawler, I give it a URL to start, I get this like bunch of documents, and I send the documents, I map the classifier over them. And what I get out is a bunch of terms for each document. Yeah. Um, the one you with yeah. So somehow have I, we haven't like really said what is in a document, but let's say that it sort of retains that information somehow. So it has um, inbound links, um, which would be a bunch of documents again, I think, and then outbound. Again, a bunch of documents. And then probably a bunch of terms, which get attached during the classification stage. And a URL. So that's probably what our document looks like. So we need, these are like all really great steps. And then it seems like we need one more thing to actually get, like I want to be able to search this index somehow. So I feel like I need one, it's like I need something on the back end to take all these documents with classification. So I've got like a whole bunch of documents, they all have terms. Um, and we need to somehow like figure out which subset of them we want, yeah. Yeah, we want a, yeah, we want a database of some, some kind. Um, and it's going to take bunch of documents, and it's going to be, um, it's going to need to map them, right, from terms to lists of documents. So, um, so I guess we'll say its input is actually a term, and its output is a list of documents. In fact, maybe we should have moved this up here. We kind of got started on crawling really fast, but this is, this is the fundamental thing that we're doing, right? We, we're trying to like, input a term and get out a list of documents. So if we can do that, then we've solved the problem. And it looks like we have the chain of things that are necessary to do that. We can crawl from a URL and get a bunch of documents. We can classify those documents in terms of, or we can like, find the terms from each of these documents. And then we need to, we're, we're actually missing something, right? Because like, this doesn't quite do what we want it to. So maybe we just need to change this and call this the index. And it's going to take a bunch of documents, and it's going to return something that maps um, terms onto a list of documents, which I guess is a database. That's what we called this thing. So we'll call this the indexer. <clears throat> so this is actually pretty close to the arrangement Google has. Um, there's one additional problem that they're solving that we have not yet solved. And I'm going to articulate that as the results suck. <laughs> Because they would probably, right? There's no, there's no actual ranking going on at any point here. There's just like, do, does this term or does this collection of terms occur in, um, in 
like a document. That's the only way we know if a document is included. So what are some ways that we can do better than that? Yeah, so you can do something from the front end and be like, okay, people followed this link and like that we should probably move it up closer to the top. Yeah. Yeah, so possibly you have read the PageRank paper because this is, this is, an, yeah, this is in fact how PageRank works. Um, there's, yeah, so the, I, the ideas are um, basically upvote certain links when they're followed and presumably when someone follows them and then doesn't come back, that's actually a win. Um, another option is to like rank pages based on how many other pages link to them and how well regarded those pages are, like what those pages page rank is. As you might imagine, that's, that's like quite a like touchy process. It's, it's actually, um, it's a problem analogous to like atmospheric current flow because the page rank of a page is dependent on the page rank of all the pages going into it. And so like the whole thing sort of has to settle. So we're, hmm. Yeah, let's actually do it. Like, what are the pieces we need to make that thing happen? So first of all, at some point in here, we need to introduce a ranking. And the thing is, the ranking is going to be per term, right? So like a document that is like all about Britney Spears has a really high page rank for um, the terms Britney and the terms Spears and a pretty low page rank for the terms like React.js. <laughs> so we want to be able to somehow indicate that. So indicate that like for a given term, we have like a complete ranking of documents. So that sounds like a thing that we have. For a given term, we have a list of documents ranked, like sorted. And that looks a lot like our database, in fact. So maybe this is something that can happen in, like after the indexer. So like after the indexer, which like takes a bunch of documents and then outputs something that just maps terms to documents. Let's, um, let's say that there's another thing which takes a, let's say this outputs an index, because that makes sense. Um, let's say that there's something that takes a index, whatever shape that is, and we can sort of shore up the shape a little bit more, and produces, I guess it's a sorted index, right, a ranking. OK, so that's the big piece. What are the smaller pieces that we need? We have basically, for each term, we have a list of documents. So that's what the indexer gives us. Like for each, for each term, we have a list of documents that um, fit that term, that contain that term on them. And then for each document, we know it's inbound links and it's outbound links and some other miscellaneous data. Mm -hmm. Stay on for That's a certain right. amount of time, increase its rank. But that also decreases from the initial user experience, so you probably want to keep that last. And the third thing would probably be if you, how do I say this? So, like, you have a list of all of these documents about React. Mm -hmm. There will be words in those documents that occur over and over again. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. maybe something like Redux, or maybe something like JSX. And for those words, for words that occur very often, the articles that contain those words, which is sort of counterintuitive, but I'm not saying like those, those articles would tend to float up in ranking as well. So that is a separate problem that actually is something that Google Search ends up doing. Um, it, it uses a, some, uh, like this notion of semantic clustering. So basically, if you search for Britney and Spears, then it will uprank all music-related um, document sets. But it's, not, it's sort of not a part of the basic page rank, which, is, which does identify authority figures, but it doesn't actually do it by any um, a priori knowledge of who is an authority figure. It just looks at the graph and is like, well, everyone is linking to this guy's blog. I guess like this, oh, I was going to say, what's his name? Who wrote Redux? Dan Abramowitz? I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I guess this guy is the Redux guy. <laughs> Um, and it just infers that by the fact that like everyone links there about like with certain terms. And so we can imagine like I, the the way this is handled at Google is this um, project called MapReduce, which is just which is mostly interesting because it is able to operate on huge swaths of data. Um, but in a very simple way, we can imagine like what it means to like construct the ranking for like a small set of pages by saying that, okay, we need something that's going to map um, a document to a ranking, and then something else that's going to, to like a tentative ranking, and then something else that's going to flow the ranking from adjacent documents into each other. So this first step is the, um, what should we call it? Like, guesser, which is going to take a document and output a ranked document. Um, and here's where we can start putting in notes, like based on um, rankings of inbound links. And then secondarily, we have, I'm just going to call it the reducer, which takes um, a collection of ranked documents and outputs another collection of, uh, wait, it should reduce, right? So it should, mm. oh, this is actually going to output our ranking or our final, our database or what we're calling the index. And it does this step by going through and finding, like looking at all adjacent documents and flowing there, saying like, okay, you have 10 things linking into you. They have 10 things linking into them. They have 10 things linking into them. And it sort of, it recursively applies um, the page rank formula, which looks suspiciously like the formula for um, incompressible flow in a fluid. <clears throat> okay, so that's obviously a, giant, giant engineering project that we sketched out in the last like 10 minutes. Um, but I like it as an interview question and I like it for now because you can begin to sketch out a giant, giant engineering project in 10 minutes. And over like the course of an hour or a week, you can like actually flesh it out and actually implement it. Like you could implement Google search in a couple of weeks. It would not be able to handle anything like the amount of data that Google search actually handles, but that's okay um, because you can, you will be fitting into a different problem than I want to organize all of the, literally all of the information in the world. That's like kind of a crazy problem. Okay, so I have one more um, increasingly crazy problem for all of us and this one I don't have any great solutions to, and neither does anyone else. But maybe you do. <laughs> so the problem here is that sometimes I read things and I don't know if they're true or not. So I like recently read that Prop 52 will cost, will cost California taxpayers an average of $2,000 each. I have no idea if this is true. Um, 
So how do I figure this out? Oh, I've been very, very bad at um, doing that, haven't I? Can I pass the mic around? OK. Maybe we'll do that. Oh, can you pass that mic around? Great. So you. first, you'd have to know what Prop 52 is. Yeah, so for, first, I have to like know a lot of things about this, right? Like, what is, like, for this particular example, like, OK, what's Prop 52? Um, like, what's California? <laughs> What's a taxpayer? OK, so, so if we want to solve the whole thing, like we want a program that can just like receive this and somehow, without asking anyone about anything, tell us if it's true or not, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so maybe we shouldn't have the computer just like try and understand everything, or maybe like eventually it will be able to. Um, maybe we can take a different approach. Like, if I just wanted the answer to this question, what's something I could do? Google it. Yeah, I could Google it. Um, or if Googling it is too irritating, I could pay someone to Google it. So we could imagine a piece of software that it works just like Google. You type in um, like something you are not sure if it's true. And instead of just clicking search, you have to enter a dollar amount. <laughs> and it'll go and like find someone, maybe on Mechanical Turk, who will go and like research this and tell you that um, it, whether it's true or not. So what are some issues with that approach? Yeah. How do you know if they know if it's true? Yeah, that's true. They could be lying to me. Oh, God. <laughs> um, well, I know what I'll do. I'll take their answer, and I'll type it into the search box. Um, and I'm going to say that their answer needs to have some information. It needs to be something like, it needs to be cited. So I need them to tell me, like, OK, well, this person and this person and this person, or like these three websites, all say that it's true. Um, and this one says that it's false. And then I want to like, go and type all that into the search box and have someone else go and figure out if what they actually said about what those sources say is true or not. <laughs> yeah. If you're just going to depend on or like use a checker or depend on someone's yeah. sources, mm -hmm. then couldn't you get those sources yourself and read those? as opposed to having somebody else read them for you? So I could, but I don't know what they are. This is the thing. Yeah, I can. Like, I can definitely, maybe, maybe doing this once is sufficient, and someone is like, yes, the New York Times and the Washington Post both say this is true. And I'm like, OK, well, I trust those enough. Like, I can, I can sort of fall back on my internal sense of what's true or not. That doesn't address a subtext in this problem, which is that I think a lot of people don't have a very good intuitive sense of like what is trustworthy and like what is true or not. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. So like, if you do this, what if you get back like an ambiguous answer? Like, possibly. Right. Right. So our answers probably aren't going to just be like true or false, right? Because this is, this in fact is like a speculative statement, right? Like this proposition, which has not passed, and I don't know if it did pass because it was like before the election, um, may or may not cost people something. So probably you can't say that it's like definitely true or definitely not true. You have to say like, okay, well, we think it's true and we have like this degree of certainty. So like a, a truth value is actually like true or false and some kind of, um, some kind of certainty, which maybe it's like zero to one. <clears throat> so that's like a start, right? Like now, now we're working in something that is recognizable as the space of um, as the space of truth that we inhabit, where like nothing is like really completely certain. So let's maybe let's try just like sketching out the the solution where we have people go and Google this stuff for us. Um, it might seem wasteful. It might be like, well, why don't you just 
Google it yourself, but I'm kind of hopeful that by applying recursion to this problem, we can get somewhere interesting. So let's say we have like a verifier, and they're going to take propositions. Ha ha ha, not this kind of proposition, this kind of proposition. Um, and they're going to um, output like a set of truth values and here, let's say it's a citation and a citation is a truth value and a um, source. <clears throat> and so something I'm noticing as I look at this is I'm like, well, it would be really nice if verifiers could verify the output of it, like, it would be nice if our verifiers could verify each other. So this output has to match this input, which means that a citation has to be a kind of proposition, which seems fine. Um, since we, don't, we haven't actually really specified like, how we're storing a proposition, we can just kind of assert that whatever a citation ends up being, it should, we should be able to like, run this recursively. So this, if we do this enough times, if we kind of have the verifiers verify the verification, um, we might end up with a, like, something like PageRank, where we can see that the truth value begins to coalesce on some degree of certainty and some kind of truth as we sort of repeatedly apply this process. We can imagine, like, other ways of taking this, maybe, where we have a certain budget, right? Like I said, I enter $100. Um, and then it somehow figures out how to best spend that $100 on like original research versus verification of that research to get me to like some reasonable state of certainty or to get me to the best state of certainty that it can. So that is a system that no one has yet devised. Maybe it'll be you. Um, and probably won't com completely solve, may not even like partially solve the hard problem of fact checking and the even harder problem about knowing what truth is. Because implicit in this approach is a statement about like what truth is, which is kind of that we all agree on things that are true. And that might not be the case. It might just turn out to be completely like incorrect that if you like poll a bunch of people about facts, you're going to get like reasonably factual answers. And I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> but I do know that, um, that working in this space, like playing in this playground, um, is both important and will probably get us closer to an understanding of truth and an understanding of how to pursue it um, than well, certainly than failing to do so entirely. Um, but also, it, it, gives us, it gives us like something to start with, right? So if we, create, if we create a system, in fact, any system we create is living and changing and definitely not going to come out the right way the first time. Um, but it gives us something, and like by keeping in mind like what problem it is that we're trying to solve, it gives us a gradient that we can um, advance towards. It gives us a goal. OK. Um, questions about anything so far? This is the last, um, this is the last case study. Yeah. No? OK, great. Um, so I have a couple more things for you. And then I'll let you go back to your projects. OK, so I want to revisit this thing that I said in the beginning, which, again, I, I said it sounded like a dig at art, and it wasn't a dig at art. Um, because I actually think that creating problems is one of the most important things we can do. So. In fact, in that last case study, I'm both noticing a problem that like, lots of people have noticed and talked about, but 
that wasn't, it wasn't like considered a significant issue. Like it wasn't something that rose into public consciousness until like relatively recently, until we started to like actually see and like problematize some of the like information sharing dynamics in the world today that seem to be having like actual real impacts on people. And that's, that is something that like journalism does and it's also something very important that art does. Like art seeks to merge into consciousness things that usually lie beneath that. So you might not think much about like the color red, but then if you're in the room with a Rauschenberg, you sort of have to deal with the new question, like why does this color have this effect on me? And those are important, right? Like I think of problems not as just things that need to be solved, but as playgrounds that help us like understand ourselves and understand our worlds. They create like a space and give us tools for inquiry. And this is not a dichotomy, right? You might have noticed in the course of your capstones that we create way more problems than we solve for ourselves <laughs> as programmers. Like it is, it is almost all our fault all the way down. <laughs> and that's okay, right? This, these are like two sides of the same coin. These are two sides of the creative process. We are constantly going to be um, creating, like discovering that we had some need that we didn't think we had and thereby creating a problem and then working on ways to solve it. That is the way that like life proceeds. Um, like we think, of, we think of calculus, for example, as a solution to a problem. Um, but of course, calculus, in fact, created vastly more problems than it'll ever solve. So this was on my title slide. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Yeah, um, this is La Sagrada Familia. Uh, it is a, it's a church in Barcelona. Calling it a church is underselling it a little bit. Um, it is, it is incredible. Like the ceiling, this is the ceiling and it's held up by these like bifurcating geometric columns. Walking in is like walking into the mind of an angel. Um, and then the outside is this like acid trip come to life which is this like menagerie of hallucinogenic icons like rising out of the ground. Um, it, it like kind of looks like it's, it's like made of chocolate or dirt or something and like it's rising out of the earth of its own volition. And in a sense it is doing that because everyone who th conceived of this is dead. Like this was designed by Anthony Gaudi and it was commissioned by someone else and Gaudi died during its construction, not like by constructing it, he just like died during construction. And then some general took it over and then there was the civil war and like it was lost. There's like a whole history, but basically the people who are now like involved in constructing it were not, are like completely disconnected. They're not like the relatives of anyone who started it. And they're working from Gaudi's original plans and they're not getting funding from anywhere. The funding comes from people going to look at this thing because it's amazing. So in this very real sense, it's, this building is an idea. Like it is a, a plan that has a life of its own. It has grown beyond any of its creators and is now like constructing itself. It should be done in 2030 and I suppose in 2031, that's when the screaming starts. Um, this is, this kind of solution, this organicity is something that I personally think we should strive for in all of the things we create. Um, we should seek to make things that are bigger than ourselves and things, and like that's gonna happen like no matter what. Any, anything you make, especially in software, especially in software now, anything you make has the potential to like go out and change the world in startling, unsettling, and unpredictable ways. And you have to be aware of that and like engage and be willing to engage in this constant process of positioning your work and positioning your creations within the world and making sure that they have a place within it. Um, I don't think the like, I don't think this like power should scare us, but I do think that we need to take it as, we, as a significant mark of responsibility. Um, and in this process, we're definitely, we're going to be wrong a whole lot and that's okay. 
it's a continuous process of like asking and re-asking these questions and other questions um, in order to make sure we're on target and that we're solving problems that people actually have and creating problems that people actually need to discover. So thank you all for listening. That is what I have for you today. Um, if you want to talk about this anymore, um, I will be around for another couple of hours. So thank you so much. Good luck on your capstones and everything else you're working on. Okay. Was it? Yeah. Yay.